Dr. Justin Smith is a pediatrician active in social media. Unlike a lot of physicians, he chose Facebook as his primary platform for communicating to the parents of his patients. Learn more about why he chose that on Get Social Health. Welcome to Get Social Health, a conversation about social media and how it's being used to help hospitals, social practices, healthcare practitioners, and patients connect and engage via social media. Get Social Health brings you conversations with professionals actively working in the field and provides real life examples of healthcare social media in action. Here is your host, Janet Kennedy. Welcome to Get Social Health. Today, my guest is someone who's actually taking a dare. He's out there using Facebook as a private physician and as a member of a large hospital association, and he is posting that content on his own. I think this is going to be a fascinating conversation with Dr. Justin Smith, also known as the Doc Smitty. Welcome to Get Social Health, Justin. Hey, Dan, thanks for having me. I am thrilled to be talking to you. Um, we talked a little bit in our uh, pre-podcast discussion about the fact that very few physicians are working directly in Facebook. They may be there through their practice or through an ad agency or through their hospital, but not necessarily maintaining their own Facebook page. So that's pretty exciting. And it's a fun Facebook page and really interesting. So I, I hate to jump right into this without doing some background on you first, however. So tell me a little bit about uh, your background as a physician and how you ended up where you are today. Sure. So I finished my training um, about seven years ago and uh, trained at Texas Children's in Houston. Wasn't really even aware of online presence at that point, which is too bad because Dr. Vardabinan would have been a great uh, mentor to help me get started down there. But um, I moved into private practice out in a small town in West Texas. Um, it's actually the practice I grew up going to when I was a kid and a patient, and I took over for my old pediatrician. And just over time there, I began to realize that uh, patients – we're increasingly seeking out information online and even bringing it into the office. And of course, there's this old sort of stereotypical or joke or statement of you know how bad you know information parents parents were bringing in, and we were having to address and and deconstruct the myths. And I just said, you know, we complain about it, but why don't we actually do something about it? And fortunately, there was already people in the space that I could um, sort of watch and see what they were doing. And um, so I have really some great uh, virtual mentors who, you know, may not even really know how much I've learned from them. But um, I began sort of trying to figure out how I could engage with patients online. And since then, you know, now I've moved to Cook Children's, which is a larger uh, multi-specialty group um, with our own hospital. Uh, it's Cook Children's Medical Center here in Fort Worth. And uh, uh, after some time, just sort of interacting with their marketing team and, and intermittently creating content for their blog, um, they asked me to step in and be a member of the marketing team as the medical advisor for digital health. And I've been doing that for about, um, I guess, about 15 months now. Oh, that's excellent. Now, are you practicing still? Yes, I still practice four and a half days a week. Um, um, we're currently actually in the process of moving me over to a um, new uh, clinic with a new model. It's going to be still traditional pay, but it's going to be a very innovative model, um, really based on this idea that um, connectivity to patients is really important. So we're going to use um, social media, we're going to use in-office um, uh strategies to really increase our level of connectedness with patients, with the community, and then also connectedness through technology with new and innovative um, ways of delivering medicine. Oh, no, here we thought, I thought we were going to have a Facebook conversation. Now, we're, you're talking about a total rethink and innovation in how you're working with patients and patients' parents. Is that because you're a pediatrician and this is a much younger parent demo, or are you talking about actually all levels, not just pediatrics? Oh uh, Yeah, we're, we're specifically focusing on pediatrics, and I think it is a good um, uh, patient population because their parents, uh, most of them are digital natives, so a lot of this is inherent in their day-to-day -day life. And so I think um, trying to meet them where they are, um, you know, is good for education, but I think we have – um, some other ways we can use that connection to really improve their ability to parent, which is really kind of why I got involved with social media in the first place, is to provide um, resources for parents, whether it be parenting or, um, or medical information. Okay, so let me break down what is the experience like 
for a patient in your new innovative concept versus a, a traditional um, visit to the pediatrician? Yeah, so um, we will still provide, you know, just high quality pediatrics in office, um, you know, standard visits, but we're also going to be uh, rolling out telemedicine um, capabilities. Um, we're also going to be uh, rolling out um, some ways of engaging patients while they're in the office um, as far as ways to uh, get them registered, um, gather their history uh, with the use of some technology, and then uh, delivering content so that parents will be able to kind of pick and choose uh, what they, how they want to spend their time in the office. So if they're in for sore throat, um, once they're done with their registration, um, they may have a tablet that then rolls out uh, content about sore throat so that they could spend any time that they're waiting in the office learning about what their kid's in there for. So you would actually provide some of this technology as well as assume they would come in and maybe download an app? Yeah, actually, it'll be, yeah, they'll, they'll be able to do both. And then we'll, we'll, we are in the works of uh, developing a full app that will basically give them a broad look at all the services provided so that they can go to one hub and link out to whether they want to uh, message me directly, um, connect via telemedicine um, if they need to, or get content, schedule an appointment, really whatever they can do, whatever services we're offering through the office. Our development team is working on a on a central hub to allow them to access me in whatever way fits for them. I mean, the way I look at it is it's the right care for the family at the right time. And so I want them to be able to have a menu uh, that they think fits best. And if we get into conversation on one and I realize that it's not appropriate for the problem, um, then we'll move over to whatever um, mode is necessary all the way up into a um, in-person visit. Oh, I understand. So, for instance, uh, I'm a parent and I have three kids, but only one is sick. The idea of packing all three of them into the car to come to the doctor's office when it is a maybe a straightforward issue that we as physician patient are already aware of. So you might be able to solve that problem via telehealth. Exactly. Oh, fascinating. Now, what kind of platform would you use for that? Is it a very specific HIPAA secured environment? Yeah, we, we have vetted vendors, and we're in the process of finalizing a contract at this point. Oh, excellent. So how many people will be involved in uh, this new – is it is it going to be a whole new practice? Yeah, it'll be a new office. I mean, we have um, now dozens of primary care offices in our system, but it'll be a new practice in a new geographical area that we hadn't been in before. Um, we're going to start it as a really lean model, um, really considered almost like an entrepreneurial venture. Uh, we're going to be sure that the um, delivery of patient care works for patients. We're going to be sure that business-wise it doesn't make um, that it makes sense for us. And then hopefully, as we uh, test and confirm that some of these strategies work, then we'll offer them up as a menu to the rest of our health system. That's fascinating. And you know, I think a, a lot of patients would say. Hey, I don't need all this extra stuff. You know, the, I think the lean startup concept is, is fascinating and I'll, I'll be very interested to follow your process. When did you say this new office would be opening? We picked real estate and we'll probably break down in August. So we're looking at the beginning of 2016. Okay, great. Well, we'll be following that adventure of yours. Well, it sounds like Cook Children's is incredibly innovative and forward thinking. Is that from the sea level down? Oh, certainly. Um, you know, we, from the time that they decided to bring me on to the marketing team, um, and even before that, really, we had been working with, our team had been working with physicians to have them involved in digital content for years. And we have a great uh, senior content specialist who um, has great relationships with all of our doctors. And because of that, the executives were used to seeing physicians out there um, and involved in our in our blog at that point. Right about the time they brought decided to bring me on or decided to ask me to come on, um, we were in the process of rolling over to a more a newsroom strategy with more frequent posting and more real-time health issues. And so when they uh, saw the need for more content, saw that I was someone who could generate content pretty quickly um, and stay abreast of what's going on in the pediatric world, um, they went to uh, sort of the executives and said, hey, we, we'd really like to bring him in. So uh, would that be okay? And they um, supported me. They knew me and trusted me clinically at that point and had seen what I'd already been doing online. And so it was made a pretty good fit for their goals aligned with what I was looking to do as well. 
How hard was it to uh, learn about the marketing side of the business, or are you really just focused on content and being who you are, and it just happens to be the right fit at the right time? Yeah, I think that's more. I think it's more the second uh, that um, my goal is has always been to be um, transparent with my families, whether that's here in the office or online, and so they. Um, commonly see my parenting struggles, whether it's through a long blog post or just a quick uh, uh, picture on Instagram or Facebook, you know, with what we were doing that day and how we survived a rough day. So, um, you know, I think because of that, it fits well with uh, sort of the idea of content marketing that, you know, we're just going to kind of tell our story. And that story for me is that I'm a pediatrician, I'm a digital health um marketer, really, and I'm a parent with, you know, six, four, and almost three-year-old kids. Oh, you have a busy life. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a lot of fun, but it's busy. <laughs> well, now, I would say that uh, the pushback I hear in my head is, how, how do you have time for social media with three kids and a busy practice and this second opportunity at Cook Children's on digital side? I mean, obviously, you need to walk the walk, but um, how do you find time for it? Yeah, I mean, for me, the creating content has always just been an extension of what I'm doing in the office. So, um as I'm sitting talking with families and I get a question or I see a series of two or three cases of um, hand, foot, and mouth disease or whatever thing happens to be going around, um, what I tell the families just easily translates into a blog post. And I've had to learn to, um, when the idea comes down, get get it down somewhere, capture it so that I know that I need to come back to that later. And then when I have an hour, I might crank out a couple of short blog posts some of them may need to be fleshed out and longer. Some of them may work as really short pieces. And then at some point, you know, as a physician who's busy and doing this, you have to let go a little bit. You get the content created and then you let your writers and editors and marketers um, take it and make sure that it's cleaned up and everything. And I, I, for instance, I don't usually write my headlines because I, that's not my strength and it's, I have to let go of the things I'm not as good at and don't have as much time for. So I write the content and I kick it over. They send me a couple of head, headline suggestions and then I choose those. What a great partnership. I can think of a lot of folks right now who'd be quite envious to have that kind of relationship. So, uh, so tell me about how it works with the marketing team. Uh, how many folks are, are doing it over there at, uh, Cook Children's yeah. and how does it work? We're, we're a really, really lean, small team for sort of the level of involvement that we have. So we have, um, uh, there's about six of us on the sort of digital and public relations team, and we all kind of work together. Um, so we have, I have, you know, an editor that really works with my blog content, and then I have a social media expert who just follows my page and kind of gives me tips and suggestions about what she sees in the industry. Um, I try to keep up with some of that stuff on my own because I like to my post to be really reflect my personality. So everything that I, everything that gets posted on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram is all my content. But as far as, you know, she may point me towards, hey, have you noticed that uh, if you do this on Facebook, it's it getting better reach than, than other types of posts that you're doing? Well, you know, that was one of the questions I was going to ask you is about your analytics. And are you looking, for instance, in Facebook at the type of posts that get the most engagement and producing more content like that? So, for instance, link posts versus image posts versus video posts. Are you letting that drive the type of content you create or are you just posting the content you feel needs to be out there? Um, it's a balance for sure. Um, I want to reach people. I want people to get the content that I'm putting out there. Otherwise, it's kind of pointless to be spending time doing it. So that's one of the major reason, reasons why I follow, you know, podcasts or blogs of just content marketers that are outside of the medical world, because I want to be sure that I'm when I'm competing with um, my family's uh, soccer game pictures and, you know, online quizzes that my stuff will actually get seen. Um, so I follow the analytics really, really closely. And I think it probably depends on uh, your strategy or who your followers are. But certainly um, my biggest engagement is with link posts. And I think my followers just really like content and information. So I'm much more likely to get engagement, uh, likes, and a much higher reach when I post, you know, pretty most Mostly, a lot of times, more scientific information. They're, they're really hungry for that. And so, um, you know, I, I sort of gravitate towards sharing posts from other writers who, who write and think like I do. 
All right. Well, let me ask you about a couple of pediatric elephants in the room. Um, have you found yourself at all to be a target of NT, any um, uh, anti-vaccine or anti-circumcision groups? Um, at this point, no. No. Um, you know, I certainly we've written on vaccines and we've had people comment. They uh, they tend to stick more towards the Cook Children's page when they're, you know, having a negative reaction. That's probably just because there's more followers there. Um, but uh, the probably the biggest backlash we had is when I did a series on essential oils uh, back in the spring. And, um, you know, I, I try to write really respectfully of all opinions. Uh, I but also to speak what I feel to be the truth. And I think because of my style and approach, um, most people, even if we disagree, they can respect what I'm thinking. Now, um, certainly, no matter what you are, if you're public, that you there is some risk that something like that could happen. Uh, so far, I've been pretty lucky, but... Well, let's talk about risk for a second. One of the things that I hear from physicians of why they personally are not engaging in Facebook is the fear of um, an unwitting uh, HIPAA or privacy violation. Do you have any issues as people are responding to what you've posted about, oh, well, when I was in, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, or do you think folks really understand the, the how, to, how to interact on your Facebook page? I think most people get it and I don't, that's not a, that's not a common problem. And, um, I, of course, every now and then someone does launch into their long spiel about their kid and what's been going on with them. And, and I just generally just respond back to those like, yeah, it sounds like you need to call your doctor (laughs) or, you know, just kind of refer them back to their own doctor. Um, certainly can't answer specific patient related questions. And I, I have not had anyone when I say that, have a problem or push me back for more information. Most people, I think, probably as soon as they hit send, um, may think twice about whether they should have sent that. And then when my response comes, it confirms it and they move on. Most people are very understanding and say, oh, I completely understand. Hadn't thought of that. I'll give my doctor a call or whatever. Um, so I am, of course, really, really careful. But I think if you, you know, you can have a HIPAA violation in 140 characters or unlimited, you know, it's not, you have to have the principles in your mind of what's okay and what's not. And no matter the platform, I think if you apply those principles and keep those principles in mind, um, you should be okay. That makes a, an awful lot of sense. And indeed, because Twitter is so spontaneous and in the moment, I think you're probably more likely to maybe make a stumble there as opposed to Facebook. There is no obligation to immediately respond to everything. And, and the timeline for expected response is longer in Facebook. So you have a moment to actually read it, reflect on it, and determine what you want to do with it as opposed to being in the in the speed of the moment and making a mistake in, in Twitter, for instance. Of course, and you know, I'm, I have fortunate that I have a good team behind me. So if any comment does come across that um, I'm not really sure how to respond, I can always get two or three people on the phone to talk through and, and figure out if what the best next step is. You know, that might be, um, you know, pulling that conversation offline. It might be just a general response, like pushing the person back to the doctor. If it's another, or if it's another issue, just, you know, um, you know, just making sure that we're always careful. Well, now we did talk a little bit about Cook Children's and the marketing team there. And now I'm curious about branding. So you have the Doc Smitty, both in Facebook and Twitter, and then there's Cook Children's. So how do you separate the two? And do those properties belong to you if you were ever to leave Cook Children's? Is this going to be your Facebook page and your Twitter profile? Um, so it was uh, mine before uh Cook Children's, um, and then when I signed my contract, it in some ways became theirs. Uh, so uh, I think we have to cross that bridge when we get there. But I, it's, I, I believe it would probably stay with them, which is okay. I mean, at that point, um, if I'm leaving Cook Children's, um, I'm looking to probably I would be looking to do something different. And um, uh, I think at that point, I'd probably be looking to move on to another company or something like that. And so at, at this point, it's not a not a, something I've really thought heavily about. How about the content for your page? Now, are are you actually sitting there posting everything or do you actually have some help from the, the marketing team with sort of the just the technical scheduling and, and admin? Now, I, I do that myself. And, I, you know, I think it's I think it's important. It's important for me to do that because anytime I share anything, even if it's an article from some other 
source, I do like to throw my little comment at the top just to kind of give a little sense of what I'm thinking about it or why I'm posting it. And so for me, um, that's important. So what I try to do is, um, you know, I spend maybe 15 minutes each morning just kind of scrolling through through Twitter, uh, picking out a few articles that I think my readers might be um, interested in. And then uh, for Facebook, um, you know, as long as there's nothing real sensitive about that, I might schedule those out for the whole day, you know, and I try to do two or three posts a day. Um, So it's not overwhelming, but I can do that, you know, in the morning in about 15 minutes. And see, that's the thing people I I believe are concerned about by picking up a, a new social property is, gee, how much time does it take? Well, it takes a lot in the beginning because you're learning what people respond to. You're learning just the, the tool on the platform. But once the, you get it down, you can be much more organized and time manage the amount of time you spend on each social property. Yeah, definitely. I've gotten a lot better at it um, over time for sure. Well, I was looking at um, your posts around the 4th of July and just really good information, especially about the pool and parental supervision, about drowning information, about fireworks information. Uh, did you get a lot of feedback from parents that that was you know, really helpful or did they feel like you were being a nag? Um, I, you know, there probably were some out there that were kind of annoyed, by, but we had just seen such a crisis in our uh uh, area, we felt like it was really critical. And so we really wanted to make a heavy push right before the fourth that parents just needed to watch their kids. And um, any any comments or feedback that I saw was overwhelmingly positive. Um, we had, uh, I don't know how many thousands of people switch their Facebook profile to our infographic about watching children. Um, and even I had several respond to my post to switch their phone lock screen to information about watching kids, just as kind of quick reminders why they were out and about to keep, the, keep, keep an eye on their kids in the pool. I thought that was a brilliant idea. What a way to engage people and to make them very conscious. Because one of the things they probably would be doing if they weren't watching their kids in the pool is looking at their phone. Yeah, exactly. That's where we came up with the idea. That was brilliant. So probably one for for every holiday that uh, there might be some uh, concern about child safety. So, but that particularly in the summertime, drowning is something that um, is just doesn't need to happen and it's just all about being being a paying attention and knowing what to look for so well done you thanks how far in advance do you actually think about the content you're posting um i mean back to school time are you now working of course back to school is year round now but um is that something that you are planning out or are you more in the moment um i it's a mix um certainly evergreen content you know i have kind of a list in my back pocket of things I could put out there all the time. I try to stay, um, you know, at least three or four posts out. So for me, that's now three to four weeks out of at least having the start to blog post so that when it comes to deadline time, um, I'm not starting from scratch very often. Every now and then that still happens. Um, So it's definitely a mix. But um, for me, you know, I just don't know what topic are going to be out there. So for back to school, yeah, it's not something I've really thought about yet. But, you know, when I start to get ready to think about sending my oldest to first grade and, you know, sort of any emotions or issues that come up regarding that, those would probably be the times the things that would be in my head and those would be the things that I'd be more likely to write about. One of the things that I read in your bio is that your particular interests are in development, behavior, and care for children struggling with obesity. Can you share with me how you're using social media to uh, affect that situation? Sure. So, uh, for instance, development. So we um, have done several things where, uh, as I was just getting started, we did a whole series on pediatric development where I took uh, pediatric development studies or development studies and uh, tried to relay the results of those studies and then talk about how those could practically practically be applied to parents. So the series was called Masters in Parenting, and it was one of my most effective um, sort of series, and it was really early on. So that was before my following is where it is now. And so I try to just say, like, I can learn about these topics, um, and I have um, resources that other parents might not have, but then how can I... Um, in a sense, translate those down to where they're practical for parents to actually make parenting choices that could best benefit their kids. Um, so we do, you know, and then now 
we've gotten so much buy-in from the rest of the system that a good proportion of our development stuff, at least for Cook Children's, is now done by our um, developmental experts, per se. So our speech therapists and physical therapists and all those, we have all those um, healthcare professionals contributing um, in ways that, you know, probably my speaking on them, at least uh, on the Cook Children's blog, um, isn't necessary because we have other people filling in. And then I can, if I see a developmental study, or something that comes across uh, Twitter or, um, you know, out of a journal, then I can release that just on my Facebook page. So there's, in, in my mind, and I'm going to oversimplify this, so p- please feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, there, there's obesity that drives from, from genetics and from uh, your family history, and then there's the obesity that derives from poor nutrition or um, maybe even issues related to body image and self-esteem. Or is that an over, oversimplification? No, yeah, yeah. There's that's that's true. There there'd be both sides of that issue, and and we have, I believe, addressed addressed both of those at some point or other on the blog. So social media, where I, what where I was leading to, and hoping I was correct in this. So social media is full of negative imagery and uh, very bad support of uh, self-image and um, both good and bad, you know, making fat kids feel bad that they're fat, making skinny kids feel bad that they're skinny. I mean, there's always somebody out there to tell you why you're wrong, you're bad, you look, you don't look good. um, And there is no perfect body type. And we just can't seem to wrap our heads around that. Uh, is that something that you address as well? Because as a pediatrician, you're you're dealing with kids all the way up to high school, through high school. Right. Yeah. No. All the way through 18 years of age. So, um, yeah. So we definitely. Um, I, I think we have. Um, we we definitely want. One thing that we do just on a globally, not necessarily specifically about that issue, but we will talk about sort of the meta issues involved in social media. And so um, is social media uh, making you feel like a bad mom because you see all these wonderful things that your friends are doing with their kids and their Pinterest boards and their the crafts that they're making and their school lunches are really fancy. And just trying to remind parents that, you know, social media is – great for what it's great for, but it also it doesn't come without problems. And so um, whether that would be, you know, a child uh, struggling with seeing images that uh, make them want to restrict calories maybe in an unhealthy way, or whether that be a mom who's just doing the best she can but doesn't have, you know, a dinosaur-shaped peanut butter and jelly for her kids cut out every day, that, you know, just try to normalize that, you know, what you see on social media is the is the people is people's best and not necessarily doesn't doesn't necessarily reflect reality. I I honestly think we're going to be getting to a point where uh, dealing with social media is something that's and its negative impact on our lives is certainly that something that's going to be addressed if not in in medical school certainly in in post medical school. Um, training CME things of that sort because um, you know kids are getting access at a much, much earlier age to technology and to a much wider world uh, than we did a few generations ago. I mean, as a child, I didn't even know what some of the bad words meant till I was in middle school. So, you know, it's a, it's amazing how we are forcing our children to grow up so much sooner and deal with issues they're not ready to deal with. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's something that we, I think, all need to be aware of and something that we need to start integrating, um, and I think a lot of people are, but we need to start integrating into our checkup, especially in those preteen and teenagers, like, hey, are you on social media? Which ones are you on? What do you use it for? And that might be all that you need to ask, but just to let them know that someone's thinking about it with them, that they're not alone, um, and that they have someone who they could ask if there's uh, something particular that's concerning them on their social media accounts. That's brilliant and and so simple because so many kids – when they're in in the doctor's office and in the neutral territory, you know, may share something that they wouldn't share with their parents. So, you know, that's what you're there for. <laughs> exactly. Well, I'm I'm just so thrilled that you are leading this charge and and getting folks really involved in Facebook and in places where parents are right now. I, Twitter is my one of my favorite platforms because it's great to connect professional to professional. And, you know, I smack talk with my friends in, in Twitter. But, you know, Facebook is 
the preeminent social platform, and it's going to be that way for a really long time. And you have the ability to share all different kinds of information. And honestly, your page is a lot of fun. And I'm going to start cross-sharing some of your information, even though I'm a long way from from having kids in uh, child and pediatric care. Uh, however, great information, really, really valuable stuff. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, I, th- I, I want it to be a place where, uh, you know, parents can go and get information, get a little entertainment here and there, and, and, and really have a place to speak what's on their mind about pediatric issues, because that's how I then can know what my audience needs. I think Facebook does that a little bit better than, say, Twitter, at least in our area. You know, our families are on Facebook. So I think it's it's a great place to, to get information back from families so that we can we can get them the information that they need to make better choices. Absolutely. Well, if you have any future goals regarding social, uh, what what are you thinking you'd like to do more of that you're not doing now? Um, we, I think we, I'm not sure if we talked about it, but certainly we're looking at getting more into video, and that seems to be, from what we read, a uh, a place where we could uh, improve. And so uh, we've we've tried, we've done a few, and we're working on getting better at that. And you know, I think we've we've had pretty good success. It, it rolls right out there with the rest of our postings and we're so new at it. I think as we get better, um, that those will continue to perform better. Um, and so I think video is really the next, uh, horizon for us. And there, there are plenty of other, um, pediatric bloggers who are doing it already and do it really well. Um, but you know, as with everything, you kind of have to do it for a little bit to figure it out. Um, and then also, I mean, we're just constantly looking for what's the next platform, where's the next place we can, um, we can, reach families. And so uh, we kind of have our primary, I kind of have my primary with, with Facebook and Twitter, but then I now have Instagram that I, you know, I'm kind of trying to watch and see what the trends are and, you know, just trying to keep our eyes out for what's next. It, it might be a place where we can, where we can reach families better. And you are posting an Instagram. What kind of information? Um, it's mostly uh, um, infographics that are coming from our blog posts. Um, uh, and then uh, also just sort of general parenting triumphs and trials for you know, that I experience in my family. So you're really letting people into your personal life to a degree. To a degree, you know, I try to protect my kids' um, uh, privacy uh, to some degree. So I try not to, you know, of course, post straight on pictures or use their names. Um, but you know, a lot of my followers. Uh, are pe- people who have been patients, and so they see the pictures of my kids in the office all the time, um, and they probably a lot of them know their names. So um, there's some balance there, but yeah, I mean, I think it's just important for me, um, as someone who's providing pediatric information, to also remind families that um, I don't execute all of these ideas perfectly, and so I want them to know that. I'm a place where they can share their struggles. They can share what they're having a hard time with so that I can um, then say, yeah, you know, that's pretty normal struggle for all parents or, oh yeah, that, that does sound like a little bit more than normal. How can I help you? What services can I plug you in with to get you some help? So I want people to feel comfortable with that. And I think by being transparent about um, how things are going for me as a parent, that's, that's a good way to, to let down those barriers. Well, now you mentioned something um, about your patients uh, following you online and, and knowing you more personally. And we talked a little bit about the corporate branding side, but this is the side that I think a lot of physicians are worried about is is their personal life. So, you know, maybe they're out at a gala event and they're drinking some champagne and, and there's the picture of them laughing and drinking. Oh, my gosh, that's going to impact my reputation. Um, do you worry about that at all? Um, there's a little bit, you know, that concern in the back of your head sometimes. But at the same time, I think all of us are seeing a real uh breakdown of these silos between, you know, I'm this person when I'm at work and I'm this person when I'm at home or or whatever. And I think uh, for one thing, most of um, at least the parents, you know, my current pediatric parents, uh, their generation understands, really my generation understands that, you know, uh, I'm not always the guy who's sitting in front of them on the stool uh, examining their kid that, you know, I also have a family and have a, a personal interest as well. And so, um, you know, I think that is becoming less of an issue, but I, I certainly see uh, where physicians have concerns about that. 
So what advice would you give someone who is a little hesitant about stepping, not necessarily into social media, let's assume that they've they've accepted that it's there and it's inevitable, mm-hmm. um, but where would you suggest, say, a, a, a family practice or a PCP or someone such as yourself, um, if they were going to go into social, where would you send them? Yeah, I mean, I think generally the uh, general recommendation of starting on, you know, your more professional websites like Doximity or LinkedIn or Twitter is is a good place just to kind of get your toes wet. But at the same time, like it depends on your goal. If your goal is to really reach patients, um, I would venture to say that you, you can do that, that most practitioners really in the world, certainly in the United States, will be able to do that better uh, via Facebook. Now, again, we've talked already about how it's not without risk, um, but none, none of this really is. So I think you just have to... Um, Just be aware, um, just realize that everything that you do is permanent and public, and um, then if you can keep that in mind, then it doesn't really matter where you are. Like I said, you can mess up and make a mistake anywhere, Um, so I think we just have to be aware that really that we just have to be physicians of integrity, and that means that you'd behave um, more or less the same way um, with your family or with out at a party that, than you would um, in the office. And so I'm not going to be out there saying things that are counter to my message as a pediatrician. Um, because of that, I mean, you know, I wouldn't be upset if something I said got picked up out, out in the community because it's, I'm pretty much going to be saying the same things there that I would here. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for joining me here today. This was such a good, valuable information, and I'm definitely going to follow up with your, your marketing compadres over at Cook Children's because I think what you're doing is fascinating, and I, I look forward to watching the transition of your new uh, lean and entrepreneurial uh, type of pediat- pediatric practice. So good luck with that. Yeah, thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And I look forward to talking to you again on Get Social Health. All right. Thank you so much. And now, here's your social media success tip. Hi, this is Colin Hung, co-founder of the Healthcare Leadership Tweet Chat, that's HCLDR, and during the day, a healthcare IT marketer. My social media tip is be yourself online. Probably heard it very many times, but it's true. Use your own voice, speak with your own passion, and that will lead to social media success. You've been listening to the Get Social Health Podcast. The show notes are located at GetSocialHealth.com. To join our healthcare social media journey, follow at Get Social Health on Twitter and start a conversation. Thanks for listening to the Get Social Health Podcast. Please stop by the website for show notes with links to the content mentioned here. While you're there, take a moment to join the email list so you can stay in touch with the latest updates. Check out our online course tab and learn more about the e-learning opportunities with the Get Social Health Academy.